Good afternoon, everybody, and I want to welcome you to uh, this afternoon's presentation that is part of our uh, For All the People, a Century of Citizen Action and Healthcare Reform. I encourage you to look at the exhibit, which is down in the far end of the North Building uh, in the large display cases. It covers a lot of material that I think is, is very relevant to uh, women's sexuality studies, uh, women's gender and sexuality studies. There's a large portion in the exhibit on um, women's input into health advocacy over time, and there's a good section on um, advocacy during the AIDS crisis of the 1980s and how that affected um, sexually diverse people. So, without further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Jeannie Ludlow, Professor of English Women's Studies. Sorry. No, it's okay. I still do. It too. I still do. It too. <laughs> Professor of English Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. And today she will be presenting Writing Reproductive Activism from Abortion Reform to Reproductive Justice. I so no, you don't have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so so a good number of people in this room, for those of you who are not, a good number of people in this room are my students because my class meets right now. So I thought, you know, to get an audience for your presentation, you do your presentation with your class. So that's why, just so you know, that's what's going on here. So it's going to be a little bit of an interesting hybrid between presenting and discussion. Um, I would ask, for the folks who are not in the class, there is a handout on the back table. It's a poem that we're going to be talking about. Um, Kayla, would you mind like helping folks with the handout? Thanks, I appreciate it. If you're in my class, you should have, that was in the D2L too. So, I mean, you can have a copy if you want. Um, just so you know. Um, so I don't usually teach behind the podium, so so this feels a little weird. Um, so y'all bear with me. Um, so um, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a little bit of foundational information that's based on the research that I'm currently doing, and then I'm going to show you some examples from some fictional texts that we're working with, some that the class has read and some that you have not. And then I'm going to open it up and we're going to have some discussion about what we can learn from these texts. My sort of overarching argument in all of my work is that the humanities, like the study of literature, the humanities can really offer us a lot of new ways to think about issues that we think we've already figured out, right? that using the humanities and using fictional texts, using the reading strategies that we've been working on in our literature classes, gives us ways to think perhaps with a little more nuance and a little more subtlety than what we usually get. And I've chosen an issue that has probably the least amount of subtlety in the United States, which is abortion. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about why that is so unsettled, just really quickly, and then we're going to move into what I try to work with. So here's where we start. I think this is the way, hey, this is the way that most of us think about abortion in the United States, or it's the way that we think about conversations about abortion, right? There's two sides. There's a side that calls itself pro-choice, and there's a side that calls itself pro-life. They don't agree. They often go to the same places and wave signs at each other, and they're always about trying to change laws, trying to reform laws, trying to make their political understanding of people's lives be the basis for all of our decision-making, right? And this is true for both sides, and that's really important to me. There's a new way of thinking that we've been looking at for probably the last almost 20 years now, and that's reproductive justice. Um, so you can see here, this is a, a pretty popular reproductive justice poster. It was made by Megan Smith, who's in the Repeal Hyde Project. Um, so she says, you know, food security is reproductive justice. Gender identity is reproductive justice. Ending incarceration is reproductive justice. Racial justice is reproductive justice. So she's got all these things that we don't usually think very much about when we think about 
someone's pregnant and trying to decide what to do with that pregnancy, right? What are they going to do with their lives around this pregnancy? Which is how we think of reproduction often. And reproductive justice is a much bigger, much bigger frame, and it challenges the politics a little bit. So reproductive justice started in the late 1990s, and it began, and this is important for my class, which is multicultural American literature, it began as a U.S. women of color movement. So it was African American, Latinx, and Asian American, and Native American women who got together and said, you know what, there's all this pro-choice, pro-life arguing going on, and our life stories don't fit into that model. They don't fit into that model. So let's come up with some kind of model for thinking about reproduction that is about our life stories and how our lives are. It applies, reproductive justice applies a global human rights framework to reproductive activism and to reproductive decision making, which is probably what I should have put up there anyway. By which I mean when in reproductive justice, when we think about someone is pregnant and is making decisions about that pregnancy and about this moment in their life, they're not just thinking about me. They're not just thinking about me and the baby. They're not just thinking about me and the baby and my partner or my doctor. You know, it's a, a woman and her doctor is the decision maker. Ah, no, 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 no. <laughs> These decisions are made as part of an, a whole life story. And the political arguments, pro-life, pro-choice, it leaves out that life story, right? It's not a good way to think about it. So the definition that we use for reproductive justice is that reproductive justice incorporates the complete physical, mental, spiritual, political, economic, and social well-being of women and girls into health decisions about our bodies, sexuality, and reproduction for ourselves, our families, and our communities in all areas of our lives. You can't get a bigger definition than that, I don't think, unless you put the word clouds in there somewhere. <laughs> right? It covers everything. And that's really important. So reproductive justice argues that we have to stop treating any reproductive decision, but particularly abortion, as if it's this singular event that's separate from all other aspects of somebody's life. It's part of their whole life. Yeah, okay, so now I'm gonna start with some literary texts, and some of these my students have looked at and some you have not. Um, and I think I organized them mostly historically, so we'll see what happens with that. All right, we're gonna start with Sarah Orne Jewett, The Country of the Pointed Furs. The Country of the Pointed Furs is a novel published in 1896. It's actually written as a series of really short stories that are strung together to create a novel. So a lot of you I know have read um, something like The House on Mongo Street that does that kind of thing as well. And one of the main characters in the country of the pointed first is Mrs. Elmira Todd. And she is the local midwife. Now this is a, it's a, um, a working class neighborhood in Maine, right on the sea, right on the seashore. So the, the story is that there's a woman coming into the community who is a school teacher. And of course, back then, school teachers had to be single right? And they had to live with someone in the community. And Mrs. Todd is often the host family for school teachers coming into the community. And so this school teacher comes in and she's living with Mrs. Todd. And she talks a lot at the beginning of the book. She talks quite a lot. She writes quite a lot about how Mrs. Todd cures people and the different things she does. And she like takes you on a walking tour of her garden and talks about all the plants and things like that. And this is a quote from the very beginning, page four of the novel. One nostrum was called the Indian Remedy, and its price was but 15 cents. These are old texts. You're going to hear language that we now consider offensive. Yeah? Like the Indian Remedy, yes. Um, its price was but 15 cents. The whispered directions could be heard as customers passed the windows. With most remedies, the purchaser was allowed to depart unadmonished from the kitchen. Now, this is all very couched language, but here's what we know. We know that the Indian remedy was a plant that used to be called, here's more of that offensive language, squaw flower, and that we today call pennyroyal. And pennyroyal is an abortifacient. 
It's an herb that was used to abort pregnancies or to restart the menses when a person was in an early stage of pregnancy. So Mrs. Todd, as the local midwife, is providing abortions as part of her work. And look at how this, this phrase talks about it. Its price was but 15 cents. That implies that it's cheaper than some of the other things she sells, right? So she's discounting the cost of this particular procedure a little bit. The whispered directions could be heard as customers pass the windows. So when she tells you how to use it, she's lowering her voice. What does that often mean? Come on. Secrecy? Yeah, yeah, secrecy. All right. And then with most remedy, remedies, the purchaser was allowed to depart unadmonished from the kitchen. So most of the time, if you go in there for something for a headache, she gives you the, the plant or the, the herbal preparation she's got given, right? And she says, okay, now take this, drink it, and don't drink too much of it, and do it this way, see you later. But with this one, she walks them all the way out, telling them how to use it quietly. Yeah? So, so there's a hint here that, first of all, maybe this is something that not everybody wants everybody to know about. But secondly, that it might be more complicated than curing a headache. Right? Another thing that's really important that I didn't give you a quote for is that the doctor in the town knows what Mrs. Todd is doing, and they collaborate. We have this, I think we have this impression in our minds that when abortion is illegal, doctors and abortionists like are at odds with one another, right? That, that doctors are angry about this or that doctors are very concerned. But in the 1890s, it was not uncommon for an extra legal abortion provider to be known by the doctor in the area and for the doctor to, in Mrs. Todd's case, you know, if the abortion doesn't go well, if the woman starts bleeding a whole lot, the doctor knows. He knows she's been to see Mrs. Todd, and he knows how to help her out. So this was not abnormal. Another thing that's really important to know about this text is that Sarah Orne Jewett was a doctor. She was a, a, an, an educated physician, as well as a novelist. So she's probably drawing on some of her knowledge as a physician when she writes about this. I know we're jumping ahead about 35 years. Um, Edith Summers Kelly published a novel, novel in 1923 called Weeds. It's not what you think. Not that kind of weed. <laughs> so, so Weeds is the story of a young mother named Judith. Judith has, I think at this point in the story, she has four children. They live in eastern rural Kentucky, so in Appalachia. And um, they're, very, they're very poor. The people are poor. They're tobacco farmers. Um, her husband is what we call a sharecropper, which means that he works for someone else's farm, right? Um, and they only get paid for what they pick and cure and get ready for selling. And they've had a bad couple of years with the weather. And with farming, that's a thing, trust me. So, so Judith figures out that she's pregnant. And they already have four children, and they're struggling financially. And so Judith, who is, I, I think that the word that we might use to talk about her in today's parlance is hothead. She's just a little bit hard to control, yeah? Um, <laughs> Judith gets mad, and she jumps on the mule, and she takes off, and she rides the mule at a gallop all around the, the community. And because... Because, right? Because when I was pregnant for my son, and I was nine months and three weeks pregnant, my mom was saying, maybe if you went on a ride on a motorcycle, it would shake something up in there. And oh. you know, no, seriously, she did. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what, no. They don't make a helmet that big, is my, <laughs> my thinking. So, so there is this sort of mindset that shaking it up somehow will cause something to happen, right? So Judith is riding the mule like crazy, and she's gone all day, and when she rides back, you know, she rides back through the community, and the novel, in the novel it says, all of the women cleaning up after dinner saw her go by on the mule and knew exactly what was going on. 
because Judith is not the only one who has tried this kind of thing. So having failed at inducing a miscarriage by riding a mule, it doesn't work, right? IUDs are easier. <laughs> Judith decides to go the herbal route. So she, it says she searched out Penny Royal. There's that same plant again, right? Penny Royal and Tansy and other noxious herbs in the places where she knew they grew and took to brewing nasty smelling decoctions over the stove. This is like the worst tea ever. And ginger, sipping gingerly at the brackish liquor she poured off from them. But all these evil brews did was to increase her sickness and lassitude. In other words, they made her feel like crap, but nothing happened. So Judith gets kind of desperate and one, one day she picks up a knitting needle. And yeah, I know, right? And that's how you're supposed to feel, like you do this thing with the book, but she can't do it. She just, she can't. She knows it's gonna hurt and she's really not all that interested in the pain and she holds it and she like, talk, you know how you talk to yourself? And she's like, you can do this, I know you can do this, you have to do this, and then she throws it away, she doesn't do it. And then she goes outside and she goes swimming and she tries to swim in the pond and go really hard swimming like that's gonna do something and it doesn't. But then another day or so later, she can't get out of bed because she's having really hard cramps. So the thing that we have today that is closest, it's not exactly like it, but that is closest to this kind of, you know, using herbs for an abortion is medication abortion or, you know, the, the abortion pill. And until we started using the formula that we're using today, Sometimes it could take three or four days from the time you took the pills until the abortion was complete, right? It's not an instantaneous thing. It's not three minutes like it is for the surgical procedure. So, so probably what happened is actually the teas did work. It just takes them longer to work than she thought they would. Because she's also a little impatient because hotheads are usually, right? We know those, yes. So anyway, she has her abortion. And then she's like lying in bed and she's feeling like crap because one does. And a neighbor lady comes over. So these next two quotes are from neighbor ladies who have seen her riding the mule. They know what's happening. They know, and Judith, they know Judith's a hothead. They also know that she's actually sometimes like the bad girl in the neighborhood. You know what I mean? So one of the ladies comes in and finds that Judith is in bed, she's all bloody, her children are playing in the slop jar. You can, if you can't figure out what that is, look it up later, but it's not good. Um, <laughs> and her house is a mess, and so this, this lady, this woman from her community, who's like her mother's age, cleans her house, cleans her children, takes her children to grandma's, and then comes back to sit with Judith until she feels better, right? And once she does that, then all the other neighbor ladies start coming over to sit with her too. This is like your worst nightmare, right? Because it's like the ladies who helped raise you, your mom's friends, have come over and found you at your worst moment, right? So what do they do? They scold her. So <laughs> this is the lady talking to the other lady. I says to her, says, I a sow when she's a fixin' the pharaoh, finds herself a bed. Anybody think you make out to be clean as a hog anyway? In other words, why did you do this, leaving your house so dirty and your children a mess, and you're like doing this like a pig? What's, where's your pride, right? So she's like giving her heck. And then <laughs> Judah says to her, this all happened so fast I didn't have any time to prepare, which nobody believes because they saw her on the mule. Maybe it did, I says, and maybe it didn't. But I got the notion you've been kind of looking for it right along. So what's interesting to me about this scene in this novel is that the ladies are shaming her for her dirty house. They're not shaming her for having an abortion. That's a normal thing, but please clean your house first, right? So that's what's going on in this sex. All right, one of the, the, you all read, how many of you got through it? Because I know I gave it to you like last minute. Pro Pleach, Blues for an Alabama Sky. Whew, how many of you started it? Okay, good, all right. It's kind of long and I should have posted it for you a little longer, longer ago. So Blues for an Alabama Sky was written in 1995, but it's set in 1930. 
and it is set in Harlem right after Margaret Sanger and Ethel Byrne, her sister, have set up the first birth control clinic in Harlem. And it's important to know that today's political discourse notwithstanding, Margaret Sanger and Ethel Byrne were invited by the local community leaders to start that birth control clinic in Harlem. They didn't go in there and say, we're going to set up a birth control clinic for black people. That's not what happened. And in fact, the committee that invited them was a committee of clergy people in Harlem. So church leaders in Harlem called them and said, please come and do this, right? So Angel is pregnant, and she wants to have an abortion. Sam is the doctor at the Harlem Hospital. And he has done an abortion for her before, right? And abortion is not legal at this time. It's not legal. So she has gone to Sam and she has said, I want you please to give me an abortion. Do what you did before. I don't want to have a baby right now. And he, he says, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do it. Go talk to Mrs. Sanger. Mrs. Sanger doesn't do abortions. That's not what a birth control clinic is for. Mrs. Sanger did birth control, right? In fact, Margaret Sanger often spoke down about abortion. So Angel goes and then comes back and says, no, they won't do it. I want you to do this abortion. And Sam starts arguing with her. And Angel says, this is my chance to live free, Doc, and I'm taking it. And Sam says, freedom is such an abstract thing. That baby's flesh and blood. Angel says, it was flesh and blood the last time, too, but it didn't seem to bother you. What's the difference? How come a little half Italian baby didn't tug at your heartstrings like this one does? Now this is important. Of course, all these characters in this play are black. Angel had an affair with an Italian man who's white, right? And she was pregnant with his baby, and Sam was fine with doing that abortion. He's uncomfortable with doing the abortion for the baby with a black father. So that's what's going on here, and that's, this is the argument that they're having. Sam, it wasn't the same thing. Angel, yes it was. I was carrying a baby I didn't want from a man I didn't love, and I wanted to get rid of it without bleeding to death on somebody's kitchen table. Now what's important to me about this text is it was written in 1995, and it's set in 1930, but this argument is a 1990s argument. This is not the kind of argument people had about abortion in the 1930s. They were arguing, there were arguments for sure, absolutely, but this is not it, right? Pearl Cleage knows that in the early 1990s, a group of people who do not like abortion started publishing information about Margaret Sanger saying that she started abortion in black communities because she was racist and that her goal was to reduce the number of black people in America. Margaret Sanger is a very complicated figure, and her ideas about race were shaped in her time. And she did have very racist ideas. She did embrace certain, we call it eugenics now, eugenics ideas. But it wasn't because she wanted there to be fewer black people, it was because she thought black people were poorer and struggling harder than white people were to raise their children and she wanted to try to ease the mother's struggle. So it was condescending and it was racist and it was racially motivated, but it was not exactly what has been painted to be in our time. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is the argument that they're having. It's a 1930 setting for a 1995 argument about abortion. Pearl Cleach is arguing back to those folks about what they were saying about Margaret Sanger. All right, this is Anna Castillo. Did y'all read this one? Yeah, did you like it? This is my favorite thing ever. So I was working in an abortion clinic, and I had only been working there for a little while, and they gave me this whole binder of stuff to read so that I wouldn't be too stupid. Because, you know, I had like a PhD in feminist theory, which doesn't help you a whole lot with people's real lives. <laughs> it's just not there. And so they gave me this binder, and this story, that story I gave you was, was in the binder. And I read it, and it was the most useful thing I think I've ever read. And seriously, I used it all the time. I was a counselor in that clinic for 13 years, and I used that story all the time. So for those of you who didn't get to see it, it's um, Ana Castillo is a Chiquina, Chiquina writer 
who writes about, um, she calls this a biomythography. So it's kind of autobiographical and kind of fictionalized at the same time. And she writes about her grandmother. And her grandmother was a, a curer, a curandera, a healer. And at a time when she, Anna, was a child, when her cousin, who was in high school, got in trouble and had to come and stay with grandma, and they got a wise woman from the community in Chicago to come and take care of the trouble, and then the cousin had to stay there and heal before she could go back home, yeah? So we all know what's happened. It's pretty overt in, in this story. It's not hidden at all. But toward the end of the story, the cousin comes in to talk to grandma to tell her goodbye. And, and grandma is not well, right? She's old and she's really frail and tiny and she's in bed. And she gives her granddaughter this, this talk. So she, the, the girl is sitting on the edge of the bed crying. And Anna is there too, but she's young. She's like 10 and she's sort of not supposed to be there but hearing things. Were you any of you that kid? Me. When, yeah, me too. <laughs> if you were real quiet, you could hear the grown-up things that you weren't supposed to hear. Yeah, me too. Yeah, exactly. That's probably how I got here. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so Anna's sort of like eavesdropping, and the cousin sits on the edge of Grandma's bed, and she's crying, and she's sad. And the Grandma says, don't, don't feel sorry about this. Don't regret this. Think of your womb as that cup. They've given her a cup of tea that's supposed to help with cramping. She did not say womb, but pointed to her own. Eha, everywhere around us, spirits are with us. Sometimes they want to come back to be in this life. They have eyes, but see very dimly. They look for a place to transform themselves to flesh. Sometimes one finds its way into a cup that, although it is full, is not ready to nourish anything. Don't worry. It will find another cup. It will have another chance if it is determined to come back, if it has business here. The important thing is that you knew you could not provide what it needed, and so you made the best decision. So many, many times when I was working in the clinic, people would come in and say, you know, um, and, and this, is where, this is where I learned that pro-choice and pro-life have nothing to do with people's lives, right? People would come in and they would say, so I really don't want to have an abortion because I believe that means a baby dies, but I also can't have a baby right now because of, and then they give me all the reasons in their life why this was not a good time for them to have a baby, right? And so we would have this conversation and they would be very sad. And so then I would just, this taught me this. I would say, well, what do you believe happens when we die? And most people believe something happens when we die. Most people believe, even if they're not, you know, members of organized religions, most people believe in some kind of energy or spirit or something that goes on when our bodies stop. And you know, when you ask people that, they kind of stop and then they say, oh, well, you know, I believe we go to heaven or I believe, you know, that the energy keeps going or, you know, whatever. And then I would tell them this story from this, from Ana Castillo. And it really made people feel more like they could make the choice that was best for them in a way that also honored their belief systems about other people and about other lives. So I just, this is one of my favorite things. I wanted to share that with you. All right, this is a very different story. It's a novel by Jamaica Kincaid, um, autobiography of my mother. Jamaica Kincaid is an Antiguan American author. Um, has anyone read Lucy? That's the one that I think gets taught here the most. Um, but anyway, this is, um, it, she published it in 1996, but I believe it's probably set in the early 60s. Um, and the main character's name is Shuela. And Shuela is the, the sort of overarching theme of the story is that Shuela's mother dies during Shuela's childbirth. So Shuela's whole life is like trying to figure out why she doesn't have a mother, what it means in her life that she doesn't have a mother, and what it means then for her in terms of mothering. 
So the other day when we were talking all about mothering and the poems that we'd read, right? This is kind of a continuation of that conversation. So Shoyla gets pregnant and she realizes that, and it's not so simple as pregnancy killed her mother. It's not so simple as that. But her father was of the dominant class in their Caribbean island. He was more white, upper class. Her mother was indigenous, so a native person of the island, right? And so Shuela believes that it is the relationship between her parents and the fact that he was of a different class than her mother, of a different race than her mother, of a different status than her mother, that that's really what, what harmed her mother's life. That's what made it impossible for her mother to live through childbirth. And so Shuela sees not pregnancy, but colonization as the thing that kills her mother. So Shuela decides that if she has babies, she's contributing to colonization because she's dark like her mother. So she's not going to have any babies. She's not going to parent because if she parents, she's bringing into the world another generation that can be colonized by the dominant culture. Right? That's, that's her solution. She's young. So Shuela goes to a, um, like a healing woman. Um, in her community named Sangha Sangha, Sangha like as in blood, right? And Sangha Sangha gives her something to drink and she drinks it and she crawls into a hole and she's in a lot of pain for three days and when she gets up out of the hole, the, the pregnancy is gone. She's had an abortion and she feels better. And she says after this, she says, I had carried my own life in my own hands. So she sees this event in her life as a time when she took some control over something that she felt like she had not ever had control over before. Whether she actually did or not is another thing, but that's how she feels. Through the course of the novel, she has three more abortions, and she does them all herself. And then her half-sister, who's young, who's 15, comes to her and is pregnant and is scared. And so, she helps her half-sister have an abortion. It says, Shuela's half-sister found herself with child, and I helped her rid herself of this condition. It was not hard to do. I had remembered everything from my own experience. I had become such an expert at being ruler of my own life in this one limited regard that I could extend such power to any other woman who asked me for it. Now, do you hear how this language is very distant from any kind, like she's not having an emotional response, right? She's in fact, she's kind of cool and reserved and kind of divorced in a way from what it is she's talking about. And that, that becomes really important toward the end of the novel where she, she finally specifically states that for her abortion is about refusing colonization. It has very little, if anything, to do with motherhood. It has very little, if anything, to do with, with the pregnancy. And it has everything in her mind to do with colonization. I refuse to become a mother. I refuse to belong to a race. I refuse to accept a nation. Because, and we talked about this the other day, right? Mothers build the next generation of the nation. Okay, we're going to shift gears just a tiny bit here. I'm not watching my time. Oh, yeah. Um, Diane Newman is a, I'm going to get my notes here so I say it right. Diane Newman is an underground feminist comics artist and a Jewish author. And her comic, this is not as, I don't know, it doesn't look, oh, it doesn't look too bad up there, does it? Okay, it doesn't look so good on my screen. Um, this is from her comic called The C Word. And C has a one uh, subscript there, and then when you go to, it's like a footnote at the bottom of the page, and it's a definition of the word choice. So it's a pretty straightforward pro-choice story. The main character gets pregnant in 1970. She's in a marriage that is really unhappy. Um, and so she decides she's gonna go and have an abortion. It's 1970. Roe versus Wade passed in 1973, but she's in New York, and so it's legal in New York in 1970. 
right? So this is our first legal abortion from the whole presentation that we've had so far. Um, so she goes to the, the hospital and she has her abortion and you can see in this first panel, in the, this is the middle row of panels, it's a nine panel comic. Um, the nurse says, you did really well, we want you to rest for a bit, do you have a ride home? It's all very, you know, just like, just like going to the dentist or something, right? And she says at the bottom, the caption says, I did what I had to do, it was easy. But can you see her eyes? What do you see? What are her eyes made as? The character's eyes. They're just black holes. They're not actually. See, I was afraid that would be that way. Yeah, it's not sharp enough. You can't see it. They're X's. What does it mean in the comics when an eye is an X? Something's dead, right? Yeah. So, so, but she's not dead, right? We see her, <laughs> she goes on, but there's something going on here. Diane Newman knows those rules, right? She's a famous comic book artist. She knows that if you draw an X for an I, that readers are going to see that and think of a dead thing. So it's really important that she did that. We'll come back to it in just a second. And then it says years later, so even though there's only this much space between these two panels, there are many years of time between them. Years later, my marriage over, I found myself in front of a painting at the Modern. This painting is really famous, and it's really cool. If you ever want to look it up, I would, I would recommend it. Um, it's called Hide and Seek, and it was painted by Chelechev, and it was painted, it was finished in 1942. So immediately post, right, World War II. Right? Toward the end of World War II, he started it and then finishing it there. So it's a 1942 painting, and he uses the bodies and body parts of children to comment on the, horrible, the horribleness of the war. Right? So, and it's, it's a huge painting. So you can see this is supposed to be her. She's like just that big, and it's really big. And these are faces. You see them? The faces in it? And the faces actually are babies or fetuses' faces. Some are babies and some are fetuses. And some are hard to tell which they are, right? So the interesting thing is that in the middle of Chelechev's painting, right here, there's the figure of a woman, a grown woman. And she's it's like the kids are in the tree, right? And she's facing the tree, and it's like she's climbing up it towards the children. Her hands are, are like this, and it's like she's climbing up, up the tree toward the children. And so people often read that as this is the mother who has lost children in the war, or it's a, a woman who's trying to rescue children from war, that sort of thing. She took that person out, and instead she has this in front. Where have you seen that image before? What's this look like? Oh, come on, I see it all the time. On mud flaps? Doesn't it look like the mud flap girl? Yeah? It does, right? Y'all are like, we don't look at mud flap girls. Uh-huh, right, whatever. Okay, it looks like the mud flap girl to me. So, and that's not usually how Diane Newman draws herself in her comics. It's not. So, it's interesting to me that she has taken the woman rescuing the children out of the tree and placed her in front of the painting and made her into a caricature. What do you think about that? Are you looking at the painting? I was looking at it because I didn't know what mud collected. Oh, the mud club girl. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> now you know. It looks like her, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So, so why why would she do that? Why would she make the woman look like that? What's that say? What is yeah, it? Like the Madonna horror complex, and we have two ways that we can be one. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So the woman in the in the painting, in Chaletta's painting, it's like the Madonna, right? She's going to save the children. She's going to rescue the children. And standing in front of the painting, 
the woman in the comic starts feeling like the whore. Yeah? She starts feeling like the woman who is the undesirable part of that binary. Yeah. And then she talks about, in the next panel, uh, the pain and sense of loss I have long suppressed out of necessity flowed over me. And she writes a really bad poem about abortion and vacuum cleaners don't pass. Um, <laughs> it's pretty awful. But, but what's interesting then is after this row, it shows her going, as like in years later, it shows her going through infertility treatment. She never has a baby. And then it shows her at pro-choice marches. So, so if you think about it, if you think about someone who, you know, there's the excess for eyes here and the Madonna whore feeling and feeling really bad enough to write bad poetry about it, and yet, and yet, defying all of our stereotypes about that and still being pro-choice, still being someone who recognizes that the decision she made, and she says this, was the best decision she could make for herself. Right? So it's a little more complicated than that pro-choice, pro-life thing. We're almost done. All right, I, I gave, hopefully everyone has a copy of the poem or read it. Yeah? Leslie Marmon Silko, Poem for Myself in May Concerning Abortion. Leslie Marmon Silko is Laguna Pueblo and is a, she's a contemporary author. This poem was published in 1981, um, but it takes place in 1973. 1973 is when Roe versus Wade was passed. And this is April, it was passed, it was passed, the decision was ruled in January. So we're just gonna start with the very first line because the first line gives you so much information about what the rest of this poem is about. Um, Someone want to read this? Somebody in the class want to read the poem? You chickens, come on. All right, do you have it there? All right, thanks, Tessa. Yeah, if okay. you would. The morning sun coming unstuffed with yellow light, butterflies tumbling loose and blowing across the earth. They fill the sky with shimmering yellow wind, and I see them with the clarity of ice shattered in the mountain street where each petal is speckled and marbled, alive beneath the water. All winter it snowed, mustard grass, and springtime rained it. Wide fancy meadows, warm green, and butterflies are yellow, mustard flowers, spilling out of the mountain. There were horses near the highway at Granado, and the white one scratching his ass on a tree. They die softly against the windshield, and the iridescent wings flutter and cling all the way home. Thank you. Very nicely done. Thank you. So, Chinle is a town in Apache County, Arizona. And the word Chinle is the Diné or Navajo word for flowing out. Right? Fort Defiance is another town in Apache County, Arizona. And when you look at Apache County, Arizona, it's kind of it's all it's kind of a modified rectangular shape. And Chinle is like here, and Fort Defiance is like wait, here and Fort I'm doing it for you now. <laughs> Chinle is like here and Fort Defiance is here. And between Chinle and Fort Defiance, there's a river that often doesn't have very much water in it because we're in Arizona. Yeah. And then the roads go like this or like this. All right, so it's 46 miles from Chinle to Fort Defiance on the river. It's 70 miles, and according to Google Maps, an hour and a half drive if you drive from one to the other, right? Fort Defiance is the site of the first mili U.S. military installation in Arizona, and it was established to get some control over the Navajo people. That was the goal. So, oh, it's also the location of the BIA hospital until 2002. BIA means Bureau of Indian Affairs, right? So it's the hospital where Native Americans would go for their health care. So, 
The poem asks us to think about the distance between Chinle and Fort Defiance, both physically and metaphorically. Right? Pull up my notes here. Two more things about that. Okay. So, it's April 1973. Abortion has been legal for three months. They're driving from Chinle to Fort Defiance to go to the BIA hospital. It's not really all that far, but it takes twice as long to drive there as it ought to, right? How many of you have heard people talking about um, restrictions on abortion care making it harder for people to access abortion? They have to drive further and things like that. Yeah, you've heard all that. Okay. So this is 1973, and we're having that conversation. Yeah. Tell me about the butterflies. What does a butterfly represent to you? Innocence and purity. Okay, innocence and purity. What else? Freedom. Like freedom. Freedom. Okay. Change. Life. Life. Good. Yeah. Good. So, what's happening as they're driving from Chinle to Fort Defiance? They see the butterflies, and then what happens? Who's had to wash your car lately? <laughs> you should see the front of my car. Do they hit the butterflies? Yeah, butterflies all die on the grill of your car, you know? Yeah, that's what's happening here. Now, what's interesting, right, is if Chile means flowing out, and Fort Defiance is about controlling the Native Americans, what do you think we are supposed to get about concerning abortion? What do you think about? Trying to control it? Certainly it's about doctors controlling, right? Yes, good. What else? They're trying to control it, freedom. Yeah, yeah. So there's all kinds of trying to control here, right? Exactly. Mustard. She says mustard two or three times in the poem. Yeah? Mustard seed. WebMD says, if you're pregnant, don't use too much mustard seed. WebMD is not usually an hysterical feminist organization. Right? <laughs> and then they say, just don't be using too much, too much mustard seed while you're pregnant because it might cause the pregnancy to abort. So, the, the butterflies look like, well, first of all, the mustard looks like snow and then it looks like rain, right? Has anybody ever seen a field of mustard, garlic mustard? It's really pretty. It's really beautiful. It's, it's bright yellow. It's got little tiny, it's a, it's a, here we call it a weed. A weed, you know, is a plant you didn't invite, right? So it's this stocky plant with this really pretty little yellow flowery stuff at the top. And the little yellow things blow off in strong winds, and then they float around. I'm terribly allergic to it, and it's so pretty, and it's a weed. So there you are with that. But, but she says, you know, it snowed mustard. Did you find it? Isn't it pretty? Yeah. So it's snow. It's kind of like it's actually almost the color of China's dress. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. There you go. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for bringing the mustard color with you today. It's not what we think of as mustard at all, but it's this really beautiful color. And um, and it rains and it snows, so the the mustard is washing over them, right? And mustard is an abortifacient. Mustard is an abortifacient. And in their process of moving from Chinle to Fort Defiance, the butterflies die on the front of the car. I don't think this is a very simple pro-choice argument about abortion, right? It's more complicated than that. It's certainly culturally specific, right? This is something that you would see and experience in Arizona in this place at this time. It's about being Native American, but it's also about having something, having a conversation that's more complex than we usually have when we talk about pro-choice and pro-life, which is really pretty simplistic overall. All right, one more, I promise, and then I'm done. 
another comic. This is a little shocking. I'm sorry. I should have given you a heads up. But um, Saga is a comic book series. Anybody read Saga? Hey. Has anyone? Nobody? Oh, you should totally read Saga. I love this comic book series. Series. Don't leave it out where the children can find it. Um, it's not for kids. But Fiona Staples is an Asian Canadian artist, and Brian K. Vaughn is a white U.S. writer. They collaborate on a comic book series called Saga. Saga is, you can't tell by looking here, but Saga is actually an outer space story. It, you just have to roll with it. But anyway, it's about this family. Um, and they are, they're exiles, they're refugees, because the two families are at war. This should sound familiar from Esquivel the other day. The two, the two sides, only this is their whole countries are at war and have been for generations. And these two people fall in love with each other. And he's from Reef, and they have horns, and they can do magic. And she is from Landfall, and they have wings, and they're very technological and very logical people, and they are not supposed to be able to fall in love. They are not supposed to be able to reproduce. And these two people fall in love. She, oh, and he was a prisoner of war, and she was his jailer. They fall in love, of course, over a book, because you know reading is everything. They fall in love over a book. They get together. They get pregnant. And then they have to escape and run away because Everyone thought it was impossible for a wreather and a landfallian to have a child together, and they're afraid that their baby is going to be in danger. So, speed ahead, 40, 40 issues, six years, right? <laughs> and their daughter, this is their daughter, Hazel. Hazel has both horns and wings, and she can do magic like her dad, right? So she's like, she's a multiracial child who has traits from both both of her families. Mom gets pregnant again. There's a terrible accident in outer space that has to do with a thing called a time suck that looks like a three-eyed fetus. It's really weird anyway. It's a cool story, I'm telling you. But anyway, there's an accident and the baby dies in utero. And she's like eight months pregnant, right? So they have to find some way, because it's making her sick, they have to find some way to get the dead fetus out. But the thing is, nobody in the universe, in this universe, believes in abortion, except the people on one planet called Pervious. And per when they go to Pervious, here's, this is, this is Dr. Sheriff, or Sheriff Doctor, I think they called her Sheriff Doctor. They go to abortion town. And they get to abortion town, and she's like, come on in. Yes, we can do this for you. And then she sees Alana's body, and she says, how many weeks pregnant are you? And Alana says, well, I think I just finished my eighth month. And she says, we, we can't touch that. Our laws say we can't touch that. And they're like, but the baby's dead. I'm getting sick, right? All this stuff is happening. Well, at the same time, as the baby in utero starts to degrade physically, its ability to do, well, and it's, you know, its body is making her sick. She's like throwing up black stuff and all this stuff. Its ability to do magic passes into her blood. And so Alana, who has been a landfallian, winged, logical person, rational, always, suddenly can do magic. But she doesn't know how to to control it, and she doesn't quite know what she's doing. And so the magic she does is called forecasting. And the Rethian people use forecasting to try to figure out how they're going to do in a battle, right? So forecasting sounds just like with the weather, forecasting, trying to figure out what's happening in the future. But what she does is she accidentally starts forecasting their son, the dead baby. And she forecasts him as the same age as Hazel, and he, he has a name, he introduces himself as Curdy. I'm your son, I'm Curdy, you know? And so then they have to, they're traveling around because Sheriff Doctor says, well, over on the other side of the planet, those doctors over there in the Badlands, they'll do anything. Go see them, right? So they're going to what Alana calls the back alley option in the Badlands. And they're traveling as a family because they have to because they're refugees and they cannot leave their daughter because who knows what will happen. So it's about being a refugee and what that means in people's lives and how narrow your options get at that point, right? And then Curdy comes along. 
And Hazel and Curdy start playing fart games, and they're having a great time. And then Alana's heart stops, because forecasting, you see, hurts the heart. Really physically hurts the heart, not just breaks it. And so Alana collapses, and she almost dies. And this person comes out of her house, and she says, I can help you. It turns out that she is the end wife. Remember, we've talked about midwives. She's the end wife. She's the abortion provider, the illegal abortion provider on this planet. She's a, as you can see, she's a, like that wolf, coyote, I don't know, bloody hands, lactating teats. And she says, um, you're in such very good hands. And of course, they all freak out, right? Now, the cool thing about comic books and the frustrating thing about comic books is that you only get a little bit of the story at a time. And this image was the very last image in a comic book that was published at the end of January in 2017. And the next issue didn't come out until the end of May. And so all of us were like, ah, what's going to be happening, right? We totally freaked out. And I was like, I gotta write a paper about this, so come on, get on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> so finally it comes out in May, and it turns out that the end wife had just finished the surgery and saw Alana collapse, and she's lactating because she has puppies, and it's all very logical, and she's very kind, and she's clean, and she's a careful abortion provider because not all illegal abortion is horrible, right? That's a lesson here. Not all of it is horrible. I'm not saying we should go back to it. I'm just saying there were really good, careful, illegal abortion providers. And she takes Alana downstairs, and she starts doing the surgery. And this is what happens as the surgery is complete. So Hazel has to sit upstairs and wait, and Curdy sits with her. Curdy's not real. Like when they hug him, their hands pass through him. He's like a ghost, right? He's not tangible, but he's there, and he can talk to them. And so she sings him a song, and he says he's scared. Are you scared, Hazel, he says. And she says, no, imaginary brother, I'm not scared. So her parents have told her that this is not real, that this is something that is happening through magic. And she can do magic, so she totally gets it. And as the abortion is complete, Curdy just fades away. Now, this is important in my work because People who are pro-choice don't like to talk about the fact that the baby goes away. Like, that's the point, right? And yet, we don't like to have that conversation. In fact, people who identify themselves as pro-life, people who are opposed to abortion, have a lot more conversations about fetuses than people who agree with me politically do, right? And I think that's a failure on our, on our part. I think that it's a problem. And the reason I think it's a problem is because people who aren't either pro-choice or pro-life, they know there's a baby in there. The people who come for abortions know there's a baby in there. Well, that's what we say, right? My niece called me and said, Aunt Jeannie, I'm pregnant. And I did not say, oh, Cassie's growing a fetus. That's not, what, that's not the words that came out of my mouth. I said, oh my gosh, Cassie's having a baby, right? That's, that's what you do. And so this is a way that we can have a conversation about what it means to acknowledge a baby and have an abortion in a way that is respectful. And so that's why I think this is an important text. I think I'm done. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> well, I'm not done. I have one more. So what did we learn? I guess I should give you the what did we learn. So I argue that this kind of literature, first of all, it repositions abortion conversations. It takes it away from politics and places it more in the realm of culture and lived experience, right? So we're not talking about pro-life and pro-choice anymore. We're talking about people's lives. And that's what being pregnant is all about, is people's lives. They challenge stereotypes and misinformation. Several of these texts challenge in some way or other stereotypes that we have on both pro-choice and pro-life people have stereotypes about abortion. Both. And we need to 
We need to challenge those, right? They also, these texts remind us of the importance of women taking care of women. This is a long history. People have been practicing abortion for millennia. And it was usually women taking care of other women's bodies. It was not necessarily within a legal structure, and it wasn't necessarily within a medical structure either. And it presents us with more nuanced stories that see abortion as one aspect of people's full lives, which is why I argue these are reproductive justice texts. I'm done. What do you think? Don't, don't clap. Talk. <laughs> I, want to have a I want to have a conversation. What did you all think? Hey, <laughs> <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> yeah, but what did you think about the texts I had you read? They're really powerful. They are powerful texts. They really are. Yeah. From what I read from the play, yeah. um, there was a lot going on. Yeah. A lot happened very quickly. Yeah. But I think it was really... And I picked out only the part that was relevant to my argument. Yeah. So keep that in mind as you write your research papers. You don't have to cover every single aspect of the text you're writing about. Right? You can pick out the... As long as you don't be... What? Disloyal to the overall parts of the text, yeah, to the overall messages. Do you want to read Saga now? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> I really want to order it, but it's expensive. <laughs> it's really expensive. We have it here, though. I know we have it here. It's in the library, the whole series. Yeah, it is. The whole series so far. It's a comic book. Um, is the, the aesthetics of the, the poem that you had us read, yeah. um, is it supposed to represent anything? What do you think? Um, I thought it was when you had explained the geography of, I thought it maybe was that, but I don't really see it like that. Yeah, no, I don't really see it like that either. And it's not, the way I have it on there is kind of false. This is the way it looks in the book, right? There's half of it is like this. And then you turn the page, and it's like this, and then she goes into a story. So this book, Storyteller, Soko puts everything in it as if it's like all one story, mm -hmm. but they're not. So almost no, it's really rare for something to start at the top of the page like that. So for her, and one of the things we, we'll talk about a little bit more when we talk about Native American storytelling, is that stories happen, and you read this the other day in the Polygon Allen thing, right? Stories are cycles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so one of the things that I think she really wants us to get from the way this happens on the page is, again, it's just part of life, yeah? It's, it's not a separated, separated out thing that you have to consider all by itself, but you should actually be thinking about this abortion experience within the context of whole life experience. And that's what I would get from it. In terms of the way she spaces, this is normal spacing for her, I don't know. I don't know. The short answer is I don't know if it's supposed to look like anything. Like the fence in the blue cloud That's what poem I that we were thinking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it is, honestly. But all of her poems are, are spaced like this on the page. Maybe she just likes it. <laughs> I don't know. Anything else? All right. The yeah. person with absolutely no literature criticism experience That's will ask, what, what is the deal with the horse? The horse rubbing its ass on the tree? Yes. Yeah. Well, so the thing is that on the reservation, horses are very normal. And I think it's just that she's, they're paying attention. They're paying attention to things that they might not usually see, right? Have you done that? Have you been in a situation where you're really, like, intense about something and you're just doing whatever it is you normally do, but suddenly it's like, that spaghetti sauce is really bread. <laughs> right? Have you ever done that? Maybe not spaghetti sauce. I'm hungry, so to me it's not spaghetti sauce. Today. But, but, you know, it's like, it's like when you're really like intensely focused on something, then suddenly all the things around you become very intense. I think, that, I think that's what the horse is about. It's just they're paying attention to something that they probably see almost every day, but all of a sudden they're really paying attention to it. That's what I would guess. So the girls on her way to get an abortion this Um, I assume so because they're going from Chenley to Fort Defiance and if the abortion were over they'd be going back the other way. 
Yeah. Um, towards the end, when it says they die softly against the windshield and the iridescent wings flutter and cling all the way home. Yes. I feel like they're kind of like there's subtle un like meaning under because it says like, like the butterflies and uh -huh. then they read them, but they're dying, which doesn't really represent freedom. Right. Right. But then it kind of like goes back to like an abortion because they know they can't take care of it, so it like says like all the way home, wherever home is. Yeah. Yeah. Like, that abortion because clearly like, they know they can't. I don't know if I did that right. You did that exactly right. Very good. That was exactly right. Yes. And I think that's what she's trying to say, right? That what does it mean when our freedom, I mean, really, what, what does it mean? What do we confront when our freedom relies on the ending of something? Like a life. Yeah? I mean, how is freedom and the end of a life connected to one another? And abortion is one space where that happens. It's not the only space where it happens, but it is one space where that happens. And it's a thing we don't like to talk about, right? It makes us uncomfortable. So I have, this is the first time I've seen this. Yeah. And I'm a sociologist. OK. And so thanks for coming. Probably, yeah, probably my background as well, but also with the information on the slide that you presented, uh -huh. when my former student was reading it, hi. <laughs> um, when we were hearing it, I kind of took a different interpretation. Uh -huh. So in my mind, and maybe it was the way you set it up, but in my mind it's like, because the Bureau of Indian Affairs was really a way of ostracizing and taking control over American Indians' lives, mm -hmm. they're really just throwing another wrench in the play for mm -hmm. her to so they're making it more difficult. So mm -hmm. the journey there is just going to be like one more thing to overcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the whole horses thing, I kind of thought that was almost like symbolism of the dominant group. Like they're, oh, they're it's a making white horse. themselves known. Yeah. yeah. And then they're just kind of scratching their ass. Yeah. There's like could no be. reason yeah. for them to be there. But like, yeah, could be. This is another form of power. Yeah. Um, and yeah. then on the way home, I kind of took it as, and I could be totally off here, but I kind of took it as like, well, I finally, it's done now. Yeah, yeah, I do think that's exactly right. And I think you, that you're right about the, um, about the obstacles to access to health care as well. But that's true for anything with health care at this moment in history, in the 70s, with the BIA hospitals, right? That was the norm. And so it's what they would be used to. I think the fact that Soko puts the word abortion in the title of the poem, she wants us to see, um, one of the things we've been talking about in class is how you have this experience that is more shared interculturally, interculturally, and then, but there's also something culturally specific about it as well, and you, you have to see both of those at the same time, right? So she, she wants us absolutely to see that there are obstacles to health care, but I also think it's specifically about abortion and what it means to be an Indian looking for an abortion in 1973. I did not think of the white horse white, scratching his ass as a white person, and I think that's really brilliant. I appreciate that very much. Yeah. Could be off. Genius. I don't care if you're off. I think it's right. <laughs> <laughs> We're English majors. We get to have a little latitude with that kind of thing. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Well, while you're thinking, yeah, you all are thinking. I wanted to present you with a oh, certificate thank for participating. Thank you. Very <laughs> So do go down and see the exhibit yeah, downstairs. Um, there are a whole lot of activities going on that deal with, and we've been talking about all this all semester, right? What does it mean to have access to health care? And what, we weren't talking about health care, but we were talking about other things like respect, education, um, family, right? What does it mean when our identities in different ways limit or shape or augment our access to various things that are considered benefits of our society. And healthcare is one where the difference can be life or death for people. So please do go down and look at the exhibit and see what you learn and see if you can come to some of the other events.